I would like to direct your attention this morning to the Gospel of Mark, the fourth chapter. As we continue in our series, Repent and Believe, discerning the word of Christ and his teaching as he proclaimed the gospel, calling out to people to repent and to believe. And then throughout his Galilean ministry, describing and explaining and demonstrating for us what repentance looks like and directing our attention to that which we are to believe. This morning we come to chapter 4, well-known parable to many of us, the parable of the sower, in which Jesus explains the hermeneutical model by which he is using when he preaches. Jesus had a grid by which he understood how people would hear and receive the word. And he shares that with his disciples and with the crowd that is gathered in a parable form. And then later explains that to the disciples as they have time to debrief later. And so if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Mark chapter 4 or take a pew Bible and I'll invite you to stand now for the reading of God's word. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching he said to them, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path. And the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell in good soil and produced grain growing up and increasing and yielding. Thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive. And may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. These are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among the thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world And the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for your word this morning. We pray that as it is sown, that it would fall on good soil and it would accomplish the work for which it is sent out. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. As many of you, many of you if not all of you, know that I've been raising three kids for about 19 years. My eldest is 19 now. And all three of our children, Hannah, Nathan, and Abigail, belong to what is called 
Generation Z, or Gen Z for short, as uh, many have uh, come to deem and name it, Gen Z. You know that our culture tends to break things up in generations. There's the great generation and the boomer generation. There's uh, Generation X, which I'm a part of. There is the silent generation, and now there's Generation Z, which is uh, children who were born between 1997 and 2013. So, Abigail, you just made the cut, born in 2012. I have three children who are part of Generation Z, and then the generation following that, as I've come to learn and understand, is called Generation Alpha. And so if you have a child born 2014... Uh, to the present, they are a part of Generation Alpha. In raising our kids, Holly and I, we've discovered many things. And one of the things that we've discovered is that Generation Z, like many other generations before them, they have their own language. They have their own lingo, their, their own language. A few years ago, we as a family discovered a YouTube channel that is entitled Sunday Cool. Sunday Cool. Perhaps some of you have seen it. I even flirted with the possibility of showing a clip from Sunday Cool, but for the purposes of time decided against it. Sunday Cool is a YouTube channel that features a gentleman by the name of Cool Carl. And I think this is his alter ego Uh, somebody named Brock, I believe, that you see on the screen. Cool Carl and Brock are a part of Generation Z. Actually, they're millennials who are serving Generation Z. And Sunday Cool, a number of years ago, put out a video that went viral called How to Speak Gen Z. And it received 2.8 million views as of what I discovered on Friday. It's up to 2.8 million views How to Speak Gen Z. Now the video was amusing when we first saw it. It was funny even. I laughed, laughed out loud because of the humor that was in the sketch. And if you want to go and look it up afterwards this afternoon and have a Bible study around it, you can do that if you'd like. But I suspect that many of the Gen Z generation... Among us today who might find this video funny or if viewing it again might find it even cringeworthy, they find it funny or they find it cringeworthy not so much because of the comedy that is in the sketch but because of how dated the references in the sketch now are. It's like looking at pictures from the 70s as I go through them and look at my parents' photos and see all the leisure suits and the mustaches and think, oh boy, what was going on then? Well, today, it's a little bit different. I have to go back 30 years. I go back 30 years and I see how I was dressed. I see the haircut that I had and Matt Parrish hat. We rocked it together, that same 90s haircut. And we look at it and we chuckle. But in today's world, you don't have to go back three, uh, 30 years. You just go back four years. This video is only four years old. And even as I've gone back and watched it again, it doesn't get the same kind of laugh, the same kind of reaction from our Gen Z kids because they go, oh, it's, that's old. It's outplayed. It's not funny anymore. You see, today, the rate of change now experienced in the world due to information technology, due to travel technology, due to how the world is wired up and ordered, today the rate of change has become exponential. If you were to chart it out in a graph, you would see that the chart is rising exponentially. The rate of change that is experienced today is exponential compared to the rate of change that I experienced 30 years ago exponential compared to the rate of change that some of you experienced when you were kids. 
Things are changing fast, and that's why Sunday Cool later made a video about the Gen Alpha babies making fun of Generation Z for how out of date they are already. Stuart McAllister is an apologist and an evangelist, internationally known. And he was the keynote speaker at the Pittsburgh Region International Student Ministries Banquet on Thursday night. The PRISM Banquet, some of you were there. PRISM is a ministry here in Pittsburgh that we have supported for many, many years. That started here uh, in Beverly Heights with Pat and Carl Templin. And Stuart McAllister was the keynote speaker on Thursday night. And Mr. McAllister observed... Also, the exponential rate of change that is happening in our world today. It was a key feature of his address on Thursday night. Not only recognizing the exponential rate of change, but the negative consequences that these kinds of changes are having in the world. He shared with us that this rate of change and the direction of the change really is producing a level of of concern, even harm, that requires the church, that requires Christians to develop focus. Because things are changing so fast, because things are happening so quickly, because the landscape is moving so rapidly and the dangers are increasing, the the challenges are mounting, we as the church, we as Christians need to get focus, the necessity for focus. It actually served as an acronym, F-O-C-U-S, that uh, Mr. McAllister then went on to elucidate throughout his talk. For example... Just to illustrate the rate of change that we are experiencing here in the world, here in America, I discovered that on Friday, just three days ago, Friday was, perhaps you knew this, I wasn't aware until Friday, Friday was the National Transgender Day of Visibility. How many of you knew that? A few of you did. I didn't realize we were having such a day. But this day was established by presidential proclamation. Just like Thanksgiving, every year there's a presidential proclamation that is issued for Americans to celebrate Thanksgiving. Well, this year our president deemed March 30 the National Transgender Day of Visibility. I didn't know we were having such a thing. I was just getting my head around Pride Month. Each and every June is now deemed Pride Month. And now we have the National Transgender Day of Visibility. Things change fast. Things develop quickly. Banks, you wake up and banks have collapsed. You wake up and foreign wars have started. You wake up... And spy balloons have passed over your house. You wake up and presidents have been indicted. Never happening ever before in the history of our country. You can go to bed one night and the next day wake up in a world that is totally different than the one you just, that you knew just yesterday. Things are happening fast. The change is quick. And these kinds of changes always seem to move. They always seem to move us. They always seem to move our culture. They always seem to move our nation farther and farther away from righteousness. The rate of change doesn't seem to be going towards the cross. The rate of change seems to be going towards ungodliness. And seeing this change and the harm that can come from this change can be upsetting. It can serve to be in us very unsettling. And we can find ourselves very easily, very quickly getting wrapped up in the anxiety and the drama of it all. But Jesus has something to say. 
In the midst of all this change, in the midst of all this drama, in the midst of all of this uncertainty and unrighteousness, Jesus has something to say. And I want us to consider what Jesus has to say. I want us to consider not only what Jesus has to say, but how he has to say it. And in this world of exponential change and what looks and feels like deterioration, what is it that we need to hear from Jesus? Well, the first thing as we look at the text is this, that Jesus is an optimist. In the midst of all this change, in the midst of all this uncertainty, in the midst of all this cultural deterioration, Jesus still is an optimist. That's how Jesus is speaking in Mark chapter 4. Optimism. That's how Jesus is speaking to us today. On April 2nd, 2023, Jesus is optimistic. And he's optimistic because Jesus believes in and Jesus teaches us the undeniable power of God's word to produce good results. Why is Jesus an optimist? Because he trusts in the word of God. He speaks the word of God. And he recognizes that the word of God is going to have an effect. In the parable of the sower, Jesus tells us, keep your eye on the seed, not on the soil. Keep your eye on the seed, not on the soil. Our hope is in the seed. Our hope is in the word of God, not in the changing and deteriorating soil conditions of which there are many. There's cause for optimism. There is cause for hope. Jesus is inviting us to repent To repent of our constantly looking toward and trusting in the soil conditions of this world. And not in the power of the seed. Keep your eye on the seed. Not on the soil. The parable of the sower is a well-known Bible story to many of us. Probably if we were raised in the church, we probably... Heard it, it was taught to us when we were children. We learned the parable and we learned it in such a way as to remember the different kinds of soil. And when we call the parable back to mind, what is it that we think of? What is predominant? What sticks out most? The soil. And the conditions of the soil, which speak to the conditions of the human heart. And so let's have a quick review of the four soil conditions that Jesus names in the parable. The first I'll call pathway soil. Pathway soil. This is the soil that is found under the path. This is the soil of the path. This is the soil that is walked on so that it becomes compact. This is the soil that is hard. And hardened and sun baked. It is untilled soil. And so the soil doesn't mix well with the seed. And it leaves the seed exposed. So that the soil, or excuse me, so that the seed can be easily devoured by the birds of the air. Jesus later goes on to explain what this soil is all about. Jesus tells the disciples that the the soil of the pathway is like the compact stony heart of men and women. The word of God is sown, but it doesn't go deeply in. And the birds, they represent Satan who comes and steals the word from on top of the hardened soil of men's hearts. Perhaps you've experienced this. Perhaps in your family or your place of work. Perhaps right here in the church with your neighbor. 
as you've shared the truth of the gospel, if you've shared the word of God and it seems to just bounce off, nothing happens. There's pathway soil, and then there's rocky soil. Rocky soil is the soil that lays on top of the limestone bedrock that is so prevalent in Israel. I remember when I went to Israel many, many years ago, we were cautioned by uh, those who were putting the tour together not to become jaded or despondent because all you saw was one pile of rock after another. You went to one site and said, oh, there's another pile of rocks. There's rocks everywhere, limestone everywhere. It's prevalent throughout Israel. And it was very common and still is to this day for soil to be found for just a few inches on top of the limestone bedrock. There's enough soil for the seed to germinate, but not enough for the plant to take root. And so when the sun comes out, after the plant is sprouted and the heat of the day comes, the plant withers and dies. Someone like this will hear the word. Hear the word of God and receive it with joy, Jesus says. But when tribulation or persecution comes, they wither because the seed could not go deep enough in the soil. I think we all saw this. All of us saw this in America when COVID broke out. You know, we hear the parable and we think, oh, the the plant that just rises for a day, or rises maybe for a week. But what I've experienced is that a plant can live in shallow soil for 10, 20, 30 years if the sun doesn't come out. And then faith becomes consequential. All of a sudden on that day, you realize that if you're going to go to church, you're actually taking on risk. It's not as though it wasn't ever true before. It's just that we didn't realize it because the sun never came out. And then the sun came out. The challenges of COVID were revealed and we had to recognize what's in here. What is it that I believe in? Did Jesus really call me to take up my cross and die? I thought that was just a metaphor. The church in America saw men and women in the heat of the the tribulation and the challenge of faith in COVID just fall away. Many of them have never come back. Surveys all across America suggest that churches all over America have lost 30%, 3 in 10, have withered. There's the thorny soil. In thorny soil, the seed falls among the thorns. The seed germinates and grows, but it's cut short and gets choked out by the thorns. And so the plant never reaches maturity. It never gets to the place where it can produce grain. These are people, Jesus says, who hear the word, but the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for things other than the kingdom of God choke out the word of God, and the people are proved unfaithful. This is American soil. This is suburb soil. My father-in-law tells a story of a woman who was older and she was a single mom and a grandmother, matriarch of a family. And she had the responsibility of caring for her kids and her grandkids and she was poor. She had a neighbor who was well-off and well-to-do. And they were friendly with each other, but they each had a garden and they were competitive with one another. This man, he had access to water and miracle grow and fencing and all the things that money could buy to make this garden a glorious victory garden. But he could never get his tomatoes to be just 
as big and bright red as his neighbor. As this poor woman who would grow giant cucumbers. All of her produce was large and glorious. And finally, he was just frustrated and, and upset and wondering, what in the world do you do that I'm not doing? What do you have that I don't have? And so one day he had the courage to go over and say, ma'am, could you tell me what is it that you do to make your garden so fruitful, so beautiful, your vegetables so big, I can't seem to compete with you. And she said, well, every day when I go out into the garden, I get on my hands and knees and I put my hands in the soil and I pray, oh Lord, make these vegetables grow. This is all I have to feed my family. And I am trusting in you to provide for our needs. Suburbia doesn't have the privilege, the privilege of that kind of faith because of the access that we have to so much. Our opportunity for faithful fruitfulness gets cut short by the thorns of this world that choke out the deceitfulness of riches and the cares of the world. But Jesus goes on to say there's good soil, good soil that produces grain, and it produces plants that yield 30 and 60 and 100 fold, more than what is lost in all the other soil. Here, the word produces an abundance of what we know as the fruit of righteousness. And this abundant word outproduces and overcomes all the losses that were never realized in all the other soils. And I think that when we hear the parable, when we hear the parable of the sower, our default position, understandably, but I think mistakenly, is to think soil. This parable is about soil. To think that Jesus is directing our attention to all the different kinds of soil conditions. To all the different conditions of the human heart. But I think we need to repent of that. I think we need to repent of that kind of interpretation. Or at least that as a prevailing interpretation. Because it is an interpretation that focuses on the problems. And not on the cure. I remember growing up as a kid, my parents putting on Christian radio and we would often listen to focus on the family, focus on the family. And probably because I was a whiny teenager who thought he knew everything, I developed this opinion. But I think in reflection in my latter years, there still may be some merit to it. I didn't like listening to focus on the family. And I didn't like it predominantly because it seemed to always focus on the problem. I wanted to change the name of the show from focus on the family to focus on the problem. Here's what's going on in America. Here's what's going on with your kids. Here are the dangers. And I never heard the cure. We come to the parable of the sower and we look at the problems. We look at the soil. I'm part of an email distribution through a ministry called Ministry Watch by Warren Cole Smith, who was the managing editor for many years for World Magazine, which is a Christian publication. And every week I get an email from Warren Cole Smith, and it just details all the failures of ministries all throughout America, all the pastors that are getting arrested, all the embezzlement. It's so depressing. I don't even know why I subscribe to it. You see, Jesus wants us to understand the problem. He does. And he wants us to understand the conditions of the human heart. He wants us to understand the conditions of our world. He wants us to be clear-minded and, and he wants us to be wise about it. But we can't, be, we can't be ignorant of the soil conditions, but we can't focus on them. We can't be ignorant of the challenges that are happening in America, the challenges that are happening in our communities, the challenges that are happening in our homes. But that's not where our focus resides. 
We need to understand the problem, but our focus should be on the results. There are four soil conditions in the parable, but there are only two results. Two results. Fruitfulness and unfruitfulness. And out of those two results, fruitfulness and unfruitfulness, Jesus gives the weight of the parable over to fruitfulness. He ends the parable by giving us hope and saying, look, look at the seed that produced 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Focus on the fruitfulness. What is Jesus saying? He's saying there is reason to be optimistic. There is good reason for hope. God's word, when it is released, when it is fully and clearly and unequivocally given over into the world, when it is seen, active and alive in our lives, it cannot help but to produce good fruit. Our hope is in the seed. Not in the soil. It's not the power of the soil. It's the power of the seed. Our hope is in the Lord and in the power of his word. His word is faithful and his word is fruitful. His word is true and it will accomplish what it is set out to do. If we release it. If we live it if we allow it to be fruitful and bountiful in our lives, in this parable, Jesus is telling us that he is the new Adam. He is the new Adam fulfilling the creation mandate given in Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 through 29. I'll give you just a second to turn there if you want to in your Bible, but I'll read it for you. Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 through 29, in which God says to the first Adam the following, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said to Adam, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed. Every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You are Lord over the seed. They failed. But Jesus is our king. And he is faithful and true. And he is the new Adam. And he has come with fruitful seed. There is good soil all over this earth. But our hope is not in the soil. It is in the seed. It is in the word of God. It is in the new Adam. We, as a church... As an evangelical church in America, we need to repent of what I'm calling conditionalism. Conditionalism. As evangelicals, locally here and within America, we, we truly desire to evangelize and to convert unbelievers with the gospel. We truly desire to live according to God's word. But we need to repent of conditionalism. We get stuck focusing our time trying to improve the conditions on the ground rather than releasing the word of God to do its work. We seek more favorable conditions in our country, in our county, in our homes, we try to make the environment more hospitable so that people will be more receptive to the truth of the word. But it is a dated and failed strategy. And one day the church will look back and see what we did and ask us, why were they wearing all those leisure suits? Why did they all have mustaches? Why did they cut their hair that way? Why did they do that? We try to improve the conditions on the ground through relevance. We get wrapped up and worried and consumed with relevance. In response to the popula popularity of the Gen Z video, Sunday Cool has now produced a Gen Z Bible devotion. 
which they translate the Bible into Gen Z language in order to help kids to read the Bible. It's dumb. It's funny, but it's dumb. It's a dated strategy. It will not age well. It's silly. And we do this all the time. We do this with our music. We do this with our worship styles. We're constantly worried about relevance. And there's even a magazine that evangelicals can subscribe to called Relevant Magazine. We get focused on the conditions on the ground and we try to improve the conditions through influence. If we can make friends in high places, if we can just do that, if we can get on the boards of important institutions, if we can publish something, if we can publish an op-ed in the New York Times, then we can make the gospel credible to an unbelieving world. It's a failed strategy. We get caught up in overly worried and trying to improve conditions through winsomeness, if we can make the gospel more appealing, if we can make it more attractive to unbelievers, if we can just round off some of those sharper edges, people will be attracted to what we're doing and they'll come. It's a waste of time. We're focused on the soil and not the seed. In our homes, we need to repent of waiting for conditions to improve. We say, we'll be more faithful at church once the kids get a little bit older. And they, they learn how to behave in the pews somehow. I can't commit to serving right now, but once things slow down at work, come back and talk to me. Come back after I get through this season of life. Then there will be more time for faithfulness, for fruitfulness. No. You'll get stolen away. You'll get withered. You'll get choked out. We have to repent of focusing on the soil conditions. Give our attention to the word and put our hope in the word and its call upon my life to obey. Jesus said to the disciples, go out and make disciples, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. Jesus wants us to believe, to believe and have confidence in his word. When we raise our kids according to the word, there will be good fruit. When we teach our families the truth of God's word, there will be fruit. When we order our homes in accord with the truth of God's word, there will be good fruit. When we run our businesses according to the truth of God's word, there will be good fruit. When we hold public office and govern according to the truth of God's word, there will be good fruit. When we correct our children, our neighbors, our co-workers, our brothers and sisters in Christ in accord with the truth of God's word, there will be fruit. We can be optimistic because we trust in the seed, not in the soil. Jesus said to his disciples, to you, to you have been given the secrets of the kingdom of God. And then he lets the disciples in on the secret. And what does he say? The secret of the kingdom of God is that the word of God cannot be stopped. That's the secret. The word of God cannot be stopped. So have confidence. Be optimistic. Live your life in accord with the word of God. Send the word out. Broadcast the word through your life. Hope. And trust the Lord will through you and in your life produce a harvest that is 30, 60, 100 fold. Lord Jesus, we thank you 
that you have given us your word. Lord, may our focus be upon it. Not the conditions on the ground. Not the conditions of our hearts, of our homes, of our communities, of our school districts, our anxious worry and anxiety over our country. Lord, that is a recipe for despair. But you have called us to focus our attention on the good results of your word. To trust in the power of your word. To have hope and confidence and to be optimistic in your word. Lord, would your word go deep into your people today. May we be found to be good soil. May we be found to be men and women and children in which you have deposited a rich treasure that cannot help but be fruitful. Fruitful through your power, through your grace, through your mercy, through your encouragement. Not by what we frantically do to try to improve things. Help us to rest in you. Help us to enjoy peace in you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.